Thank you very much for the nice introduction and uh, uh, for the invitation. Um, probably most of you are aware that uh, there is a, currently an ongoing revolution in condensed matter by uh, characterizing uh, states by, or characterizing solids by topological invariants or topological uh, quantities and parameters. And uh, I'll give you an example here. Uh, for example, in the field of uh, two-dimensional topological insulators, so imagine this is the Brion zone. Uh, the Brion zone is periodic, so can, you can wrap it uh, topologically to a donut. And on each uh, point on this donut, there is a k-point. On each k-point carries a, a Bloch wave function. And the Bloch wave function uh, is not uh, unique. It has a gauge invariance, or has gauge, uh, gauge freedom. And this gauge freedom is basically uh, 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 goes to, to zero to, from zero to the phi goes to, from zero to two pi. And uh, basically, you can go now, you call that a fiber bundle, and you can go now, uh, you can make now a tour uh, in this two-dimensional Brion zone, and you can ask yourself, what is this fiber bundle doing? And then you see, you can either have a ribbon here, uh, the, the face is always the same, or for example, the face can be twisted, say for example, from, from uh, zero to, to pi, or from pi to two pi. And this, if the, the electronic structure behaves like this, we call this object uh, uh, trivial, and uh, if it looks like that, we call it non-trivial. And so we have basically trivial uh, insulators uh, and non-trivial insulators. So here this would be a, uh, the topology of the Bloch wave function here would be trivial, and uh, this would be the untrivial one. So you, you, want, you walk in this uh, Brion zone and you have a face slip, and uh, you have a different classification of these uh, two uh, different uh, Bloch wave functions. One has this uh, topological classification z2 equals 0 and z2 equals 1. And uh, um, basically, uh, if you have now uh, a topological insulator, which is, tri uh, non which is tri non trivial inside, and you know your vacuum is trivial outside, the only way that a wave function can go from inside to outside is by ripping off your Möbius band and connect it again. And this leads finally to these surface states, to these two-dimensional surface states. So you cannot avoid them. They are topologically protected. And uh, the, in, the interesting aspect of this topological matter is with these topological quantities, there are also response quantities involved. And these response quantities, oh, sorry. These response quantities are basically uh, dissipationless uh, edge current, uh, uh, edge states, which have a edge cur uh, dissipationless edge current, and these basically lead to quantum spin hall effect. And this is, uh, this is not only true for two-dimensional topological insulators, also true for three-dimensional topological insulators. Here you, here you see basically the, an insulator, but here you see the surface state, and this is the Dirac cone. And uh, as I said, the electronic structure causes non-topological invariance, non-trivial topological invariance. They are connected to the Barry phase. The Barry phase is then uh, connected to this topological invariance, and this topological invariance tells you whether the, the uh, uh, the topological matter is trivial or non-trivial. And in this way, for example, you can have also the anomalous Hall effect. You, you produce a spin currents, uh, and these spin currents uh, are able, for example, to um, exert a torque on magnetic uh, nanostructures, and you can switch the magnetization by these uh, anomalous Hall currents. And uh, basically, what I explored so far in this lecture is basically the, the momentum space. Of course, we have a real space, we have a magnetization space, we have a time domain. And basically, you can imagine that in this 10-dimensional uh, uh, space, you can have uh, an enormous amount of invariants, which are mostly unexplored. And I'll give you one other example of an invariant, uh, which is in this, lives in this magnetization space, uh, and that is basically the chiral magnetic skirmions. So think about a ferromagnet, all the magnetic moments of all atoms are aligned uh, in the same direction, they are collinearly aligned. And these are these red things here. And then on this ferromagnetic background, we call it also the vacuum state, you have basic precipitate uh, two-dimensional localized orbitals, or in three dimensions, strings, two-dimensional strings of finite size, which, are, which behave like particles. Uh, you look, if you zoom in, they look like this. So this is the ferromagnetic background. And then you have basically a two-dimensional uh, particle here of finite size. So it could be between 5 to 200 nanometers, uh, where you have a winding magnetic structure. And this structure is stable because the ferromagnetic background is topologically trivial, but this, uh, the skirmion itself is topologically non-trivial.
And the non-triviality you see as following, you have the magnetization that each uh, uh, atom, you have a certain spin pointing in a certain direction. And then you can make a, a projection, a stereographic projection from this uh, skirmion in two dimension to a sphere. And you cover the, the important thing is you cover in the entire sphere. So for example, this uh, uh, spin is the, uh, denotes the North Pole. This spin here denotes the South Pole and you cover the entire sphere. And there's a topological number involved, this uh, topological number Q, a topological charge, uh, which you can calculate uh, by the curvature, basically, of the magnetization on the sphere, uh, which tells you how often you wrap the sphere, uh, uh, how often this magnetic structure wraps the sphere. And it turns out that uh, the topological charge plus minus one is the one which has the lowest energy among all non-trivial topological charges. Uh, these, uh, these also exist in nature. Here I give you an SDM image. You see, for example, here a, a ferromagnetic state. You see some uh, spiral magnetic structure. You see the spiral magnetic structure in this image here. So your magnetization is spiraling. And then you apply a magnetic field. And you see in this magnetic field, uh, the skirmions are precipitating on basic covering uh, the entire sample. And this happens uh, uh, typically uh, at interfaces. For example, here ion iridium, manganese tungsten, uh, palladium iron tank, iridium, but it happens also in, in three dimensions, uh, for example, for uh, uh, the P20 alloys, uh, iron germanium, manganese silicide, uh, silicon, iron cobalt silicon. When you here see the same experiment uh, in uh, using Lorentz microscopy, you basically have here a spiral state, and if you apply a small magnetic field, you, rise, you raise the magnetic field, you see the skirmions are precipitating from the skirmion lattice. The same you can do instead of changing the magnetic field, uh, you can also change the temperature and keep the field. And you see basically that the, uh, uh, the skirmions are emerging. And you have different techniques to, to, to probe these skirmions. So if you think about topological, topological arguments, all these topological arguments work on smooth functions. So basically the people work in continuum field. And you have here an, uh, an energy expression, we call it a micromagnetic model, of these magnetic structures which I have shown you. And uh, so basically this is the, what we call the exchange interaction, this is the magnetic anisotropy, and this is the magnetic V field. But you can get only these, uh, these two-dimensional localized states, these two-dimensional solitons, if you have here this interaction, which has a, a gradient term, we call it the, uh, the chiral uh, instability or the chiral symmetry breaking. And uh, this interaction is called the jaloczynski moria interaction. On this jaloczynski moria interaction, and that is typical for many of these things, you can only have, if you have spin-orbit interaction, and you need a solid which has a broken inversion symmetry. For example, an interface or a bulk broken inversion symmetry. <coughs> of course, we have our DFT model, and uh, uh, we have to relate our DFT model to this micromagnetic model, and it is very convenient to use a spin lattice model in between. So basically, we, we do a, a multi-scale modeling. We go from DFT to the spin lattice model, and from the spin lattice model to the micromagnetic model. And our, uh, our motivation is to get all these parameters which entering here, the exchange, uh, the spin stiffness, uh, the spiralization, the magnetic anisotropy, the uh, Heisenberg exchange interaction, the Jaloszynski vectors, uh, by total energy calculations. Um, uh, and we have implemented this in our FLIR code. Uh, usually what we do is we take uh, uh, spirals, magnetic spirals, uh, uh, insert magnetic style spirals in our code, and then we relate the total energy of the Q vector of the spiral uh, to these properties here. For example, the uh, spin stiffness is given as the second derivative of the total energy with respect to this Q vector, so it would be the curvature here, and the spiralization basically is the first derivative, so it would be the slope here. And by this, you get uh, the, the constants of this micromagnetic model. In a similar way, you can get relate this uh, uh, constant to the Heisenberg model, uh, the J's and uh, the D's. They are related to each other. <coughs> Sometimes you want to probe the electronic structure of your skirmion directly. Um, and for this, uh, you, want, you have to calculate basically the skirmion in a, your entire skirmion in a unit cell. Uh, and this, uh, you have, for this we developed a code which is highly parallelizable. And you see here, this is the KKR nanocode. Basically, you see the, 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 the code scales linear, 
as a weak linear scaling. Uh, here I show you and uh, for the blue gene Q uh, calculation with 250,000 atoms and uh, uh, scaling over 30 racks. So in general, what this spin orbit interaction does for you is uh, remember uh, if you have a time inversion symmetry and space inversion symmetry, then you basically you know that uh, you have a degeneracy at each k point. The, the, uh, the band structure is occupied twice, once with spin up and once with spin down electrons. But if you have spin orbit interaction and you have at the same time a broken <coughs> space inversion symmetry, <coughs> then uh, the Kramer's degeneracy still holds, but at a given k point, uh, the bands are, the degeneracy is lifted, and spin up and spin down for a certain k point uh, has a different eigenvalue. And therefore, the electron is fooled. It thinks uh, locally there is a magnetic field which splits the, the spin polarized, which splits the spin degenerate states, and therefore you have an effective spin orbit field, uh, and this spin orbit field uh, acts like a local magnetic field and changes your properties. And many of these uh, uh, spin orbit coupling uh, properties uh, are then uh, uh, listed here. Basically, uh, you have a lot of uh, spin orbit uh, coupling phenomena in, in, uh, related to magnetism and uh, degeneracy, lifting of degeneracies, for the orbital moment, topological orbital magnetic moments, magnetic anisotropies, the jaloczynski moria interaction. Then you have effects at uh, uh, non-magnetic samples, uh, such as Rashba effect and Tresselhaus effect. The topological insulators and wild semi-metals are a consequence of the spin orbit interaction. So you have spin relaxation phenomena, you have the anomalous Hall effect, the spin Hall effect, spin orbit torque, spin orbit Hall effect, quantum spin Hall effect, quantum anomalous Hall effect. So there are enormous amount of transport uh, interactions, transport effects, uh, exchange interactions, all related to this relatively small quantity, the, which is the spin orbit interaction. And when I say it's a very small quantity, you mean immediately you need a lot of k points, you need uh, precise calculations, and due to the spin orbit interaction, of course, you lift also degeneracies. That means you need a bigger Hamiltonian, the Hamiltonian is not anymore real, it's complex, and so on. So the calculations become uh, uh, quickly uh, uh, time consuming. And this uh, aspect which I mentioned uh, is part of a very of a bigger field of material, uh, magnetic materials and spintronics. Uh, so basically the magnetic materials enters the area of uh, energy. You need permanent, for many things you need permanent magnets. The area of storage, for example, the hard disk drives. And now it's also part, uh, the MRAM is now also part of our devices. So it goes into the L2 cache uh, of the mobile phone. And uh, magnetism has also a, a future in uh, magnetocaloric materials. This depends uh, very much on the energy price and in the, t in the area of the Internet of Things, in particular due to uh, magnetic <laughs> sensors. So basically, there, behind there is a big field, uh, but I'm concentrating here on the spin orbit interaction. And I would like to give you one example where the, spin, uh, where the, uh, the proper treatment of the spin orbit interaction is important. And this is, for example, the band structure of topological insulators. Now basically, most of the calculation and the field of topological insulators are done by L, using LDA. And uh, basically do LDA and then spin orbit interaction. And a better calculation is already doing LDA, uh, then do G, uh, GW on top of it, and then you do two types, of L, two types of LDA calculations. One LDA calculation without spin orbit interaction, and then you build up your GW. And you do an LDA calculation with, uh, uh, with spin orbit interaction. And the difference between this uh, band splitting between uh, the LDA, uh, two different LDA calculations gives you a difference, and this you put add on top of the GW calculation. These are called G GW plus SOC. And uh, there is a difference uh, if you implement it uh, completely correctly, so you do an LDA calculation with spin orbit interaction and add the GW on top with spin orbit interaction. And uh, this I call spin orbit uh, SOC uh, times W SOC. And this is about 10 times more time consuming. And here I show you an example of the differences. Here at the example of bismuth telluride, you basically see uh, uh, here an LDA calculation, this green one, uh, and you see the GW calculation. Both of them is LDA plus SOC and GW plus SOC. But if you do it, uh, uh, if you do full GW plus spin orbit interaction, you see uh, the change uh, which is between GW plus SOC and GW SOC, W SOC, um, is basically uh, of the same order. 
So uh, these corrections are very large and have to be included correctly. And, and here you see uh, basically uh, a calculation for bismuth selenide. You basically see uh, an LDA calculation uh, with this uh, very famous Dirac state, Dirac point. And here you see a GW calculation with the Dirac point. First of all, you see in LDA, uh, bismuth selenide is an indirect uh, band gap uh, a semiconductor. And you see in GW, it's a direct band gap semiconductor. When you see the uh, Dirac point looks totally different. How does it compare to experiment? So we look at only this uh, uh, insert. And then you see here a variety of photo emission results. Uh, they all agree uh, to each other. They are slightly different because the doping of the crystal is different. The Fermi energy is a little bit different. Uh, the resolution of the experiment is a little bit different, but in totally they agree. And here is the comparison between LDA and uh, GW. And you see uh, this uh, Dirac cone agrees uh, much closer to the GW calculation than to this LDA calculation. Let me come to a second example. This is skirmion design. Uh, so you, if, you, if you want, skirmions are nice, but if you want to have skirmions in, in the framework of a technology, then these skirmions have to have certain properties. They have, for example, uh, they should uh, be in thin films, maybe in the order of uh, three layers, four layers, not too thin, not too thick. Uh, they should be uh, not too small, uh, but also not too large, in the order of five to 10 nanometers. They should be uh, existing above room temperature and uh, close to zero field. They should fit the field of spintronics. That means you need to, to know how to inject them, to transport them, to detect them, uh, to manipulate them at reasonable fields and uh, currents. You have to read out that, you have to read out, you have a readout mechanism. They should be fast moving and energy efficient. They should be also uh, uh, possible for, available for logic operations. And uh, people like to work with metallic systems, so it should be uh, part of the metallic magnetism. And uh, uh, coming back to my micromagnetic model, so I have a parameter A, I have a parameter D, and I have a parameter K. So basically, I can modify my materials and the electronic structure such that I vary this A, D, and K such that the skirmions, which come out, fulfill all these properties. I have to say, we are not there yet. Uh, but we are coming close to it. Uh, and the same, uh, in a, on a more microscopic level, we can use the parameters J, D, and K of the spin lattice model. So here I give you an example. This is manganese tungsten, uh, manganese on tungsten. And the experimentalists uh, tell you uh, that you have this wavy pattern here. And this wavy pattern might be a result of a spin spiral. Uh, this uh, gives you the idea that you have maybe a jaloczynski moria interaction, which is very strong. The jaloczynski moria interaction wants to have a chiral symmetry breaking, it doesn't want to have a ferromagnetic state. So as you, as you can imagine, you have here a jaloczynski moria interaction. So then mathematics tells you, if you have a jaloczynski moria interaction, then there exists a magnetic B field such that you will form a skirmion. So therefore, the only thing that you have to do is now to recalculate uh, the system. You calculate your A, D, and K. And then you see. Uh, uh, you put it into a phase diagram, you do Monte Carlo and get the phase diagram, and then at the end of the day, you know also your B field, which you have to apply to get the skirm down. And that's basically what we did. Uh, basically, here you see a, a spin spiral calculation without spin orbit interaction. Uh, so basically, you expect here a minimum. You don't have a minimum here, because what turns out is that these J's here uh, uh, have positive or negative sign on your, uh, this ex uh, exchange leads you to a frustrated magnetic structure, which is a spiral in itself. But then the jaloczynski moria interaction selects one of these spirals, here the left rotating one, and this left rotating one has then a lower energy. And then we, uh, by minimizing and uh, taking derivatives and things like that, we get all the parameters, we put it into a Mon Monte Carlo code, we get a phase diagram, and here you have a phase diagram of the magnetic field versus temperature, you see here you have a spin spiral phase, which you saw in experiment. You have basically here a skirmion lattice phase. You have here the isolated skirmion phase. And here you have the, uh, the, uh, the saturated state, which is the ferromagnetic state. And here you see, for example, the a typical skirmion lattice. And these skirmions here are pretty small because they are small because you have here a, a frustration. And this frustration determines a length scale. So we have finally small skirmions. Yeah, and these small skirmions uh, are basically, uh, you can achieve them, but you need magnetic fields on the order of 30 uh, teslas. 
But this is not exactly what you want to have in a device, so you have to get rid of these Teslas. Uh, and therefore, we have the following suggestion. What we do is an uh, interlayer exchange structure. So you have the tungsten. You inslide a certain cobalt layer here, which gives you, which is ferromagnetic, which polarizes the other tungsten material. And this polarized tungsten material exerts an internal magnetic field on this uh, stearmin active magnetic uh, manganese layer. And the, the question is now, how do we tune the thickness of the cobalt layer and the thickness of this uh, number of uh, tungsten layer such that we are in the right, becoming in the right ballpark. And this we have done, but by observing if the cobalt layer becomes thicker, we realize the magnetization becomes in plane. This is very bad. We need out of plane magnetization. And therefore we have to slide in another platinum layer here of certain thickness, such to stabilize the magnetization to be uh, out of plane. So we have a couple of parameters. We have the thickness of the platinum layer, the thickness of the cobalt layer, the thickness of the interlayer spacing. So this is already a three-dimensional problem. And for this three-dimensional problem, we have to, to sort out all the parameters and then uh, get into the phase diagram. And here I selected two systems, uh, so to say uh, six layers of uh, tungsten, four layers of cobalt, and uh, one layer of platinum, or seven layers of tungsten and four layers of cobalt. And then you see you move uh, finally along this line where you come into the skirmian phase when you're becoming, if you, if you change your uh, uh, cobalt thickness, you move it uh, also in this, uh, uh, um, in this uh, isolated skirmian phase. This is one example. The other example so far, um, you have in this, uh, in this uh, micromagnetic equations, you have the exchange, you have the jaroszynski moria interaction. So you, maybe you want to do something at the exchange and the jaroszynski moria interaction simultaneously. So if you look at this exchange, uh, there are some uh, uh, materials like iron here, where with small relaxation, small changes, you can vary the exchange interaction uh, already by quite a bit. And this we make use to, so we have uh, one substrate, iridium, which has a strong spin orbit interaction. So iron will polarize this iridium and has broken inversion symmetry. This will uh, produce the jaroszynski moria interaction. Here, palladium has a, a large susceptibility. Iron will polarize palladium and manipulates the exchange interaction. And by these two interfaces now, on varying these two interfaces, we, get, uh, we can modify the exchange interactions. Here, the example of palladium, two layers of palladium, FCC palladium, HCP palladium, changes this uh, effective parameter J. And this we can continue. Uh, we cannot only take uh, thin films, we can also take multilayers. And we can also work with uh, uh, rhodium and uh, uh, with different concentrations. And then you come into a ballpark here where you can design your material such that you have different uh, exchange interactions. And at the same time, you get different jaloczynski moria interactions, which I don't show you. So have a, you have possibilities to tune the exchange, and you have possibilities to tune the jaloczynski moria interaction. Uh, and this way, you can construct, again, a phase diagram, and you see at which fields you get a, a rich uh, magnetic phase, the spin spiral state, the skirmian lattice phase, or the ferromagnetic phase. And the last point I would like to mention uh, is um, uh, the detection. So uh, if, you want, if you want to detect the uh, skirmion, electrical detection would be the best. For this, you have to calculate somehow the conductance. For you calculating the conductance, you need the electronic structure. So you put your skirmion into, as a, as a super big impurity into a Green's function code uh, embedded in the ferromagnetic state and calculate basically the electronic structure of the windings of the winding magnetic state compared to the ferromagnetic state. And the chairman is uh, 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 waving, so I, I go very fast. And therefore, you can uh, uh, develop a number, which we, talk, which we call the tunneling spin mixing magneto resistance ratio, which is the difference of the, in first approximation due to the electronic structure in the vacuum of the ferromagnetic state, of the skirmion state divided by the ferromagnetic state times 100 to get the percent. And then you see basically uh, here you can vary this uh, tunneling, tunneling spin mixing magneto resistance by 20% uh, depending whether you have a skirmion or not. And this is totally sufficient um, to detect the skirmion. So by this I'm coming to an end. Um, so uh, the field of spin orbitronics, the field of quantum material, 
as a very rich one. We look at spin textures uh, for neuro-inspired computing, ultra-fast and anti-ferromagnetic spintronics. A uh, very big field which is coming up is uh, three-dimensional nanoscale magnetic textures and dynamics. In America, uh, they build new synchrotrons to detect it on a scale of uh, three-dimensional 20 nanometer structures. Uh, magne so magnetization solitons in three dimensions. Um, we, look, uh, we, we look at emergent complex phases in, a, in complex 10-dimensional topologies. And of course, we have to um, find the appropriate materials for that. And this, of course, we would like to do uh, uh, by using materials discovery and uh, uh, functionality discovery. And therefore, for us, uh, the MAX project is extremely important because uh, the phase space is huge. The, uh, the number of K-points, the, the setups, the, the number of atoms, the sizes of the systems are, is, are huge. And therefore, we, for us, it's very important that our codes run on, on supercomputers, and it's also important that we get a systematic screening uh, of the solids. And uh, let me thank a few people. First, uh, the FLIR group, which is uh, Daniel, composed of Daniel Wortmann, Gustav Biemeyer, Gregor Mihalicek, and Jana Alexeyeva, who are, uh, who are here. And then the KKR Nano group, which is uh, um, led by Rudolf Zeller, Roman Kovacic, Marcel Bornemann, Paul Beimester, and Dirk Pleiter. And we profited a lot uh, from the 1G90 code uh, and these developments, and we are funded by the Magic Sky and the Max Project. Thank you very much. Okay, so we